So this morning we are going to be looking at the mission trip that our team took a little while back on February the 2nd through the 8th to Costa Rica and they're going to be celebrating some of those those wins and some of the things that God did through this team but it's not just a recap and us kind of reminiscing about things that we've done before I really believe that the things that will be shared will my prayer is that it will spark something on the inside of us a reminder or possibly for the first time to know that we have a mission field right here right where we're at and we need to be engaged in it as those have been called the light of the world, the salt of the earth, we need to be those that are fully pursuing people so that they can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I did not go on the mission trip, so uh, I could sit up here and probably talk all day long about it, but I uh, probably wouldn't do too much justice. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, so we have a video worth a quadrillion billion words. So here we go. Take a look at this. an awesome time. God is moving in amazing ways. So we'll be posting that video this week, uh, celebrating with the team. I got to tell you right now, church, we've got to ramp up our excitement level. God's doing great things. We just watched what God did right there. We're going to hear more about it here. And so with that, I'd like to invite up the leader of the mission trip and my lovely wife, Rachel, come on up. Let's give it up for her. All right, so Rachel, is, as the leader of the group, is just going to kind of share with us some of the things that uh, God did and then kind of the, give us a little bit more perspective on uh, things that took place on this mission trip. And so I took three years of Spanish and yet cannot speak a lick, poquito. So um, I think that's right. So uh, I cannot pronounce the name of this church. So Rachel, can you just tell us a little bit more about that church? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I took no Spanish, so I won't even help you with that. But uh, Pastor Luis um, and his wife, uh, they're about our age. I'll be 29 again this year. No. Yeah. There's <laughs> truth. Not truth to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they're... Uh, They've just got this huge passion for kids, and I really personally connected with that. Um, most of you know, if you don't know, I am in charge of our kids' ministry here at Radiant Church. So, yeah. Uh, so that really connected me to this church because their passion is the next generation, and they're really just um, committed to the children in their community. Uh, they have about 60 kids that come on Sunday morning that they minister to. Uh, they have, they kind of flip-flop it, uh, their service. They do in the morning minister, like it's a children's church only. And then in the evening, it's a church service like this. Um, so they have about 60 kids that come to their community. They do a curriculum called Awana. It's a pretty popular curriculum in the United States here. Some of you might know or have heard of Awana. Awana really focuses on scripture teaching. And, and so these kids are really getting the scripture in their hearts as children, which obviously is going to help them throughout the rest of their lives. So uh, really passionate about kids and uh, uh, a lot of those kids that are coming to their church, their families are not attending, so they also have a heart to start reaching to the parents um, the, of these children. So, uh, yeah, that's that's one of their main focuses, and, and they're doing a wonderful job. Yeah, and so can you just tell us a little bit more about uh, maybe some of the needs that were re represented in both the church and mm -hmm. kind of the local community that surrounds them? So the community there, if you can imagine, obviously we went to Costa Rica, and uh, maybe something that pops up in your mind is third world country. The area that we were in was a very rural area and it was very third world. Um, 
lot of dirt floors for homes, uh, tin, tin built homes, roofs, yeah. sides, and uh, sticks for, I mean, I've, I saw a few places where people were living where it was really surprising that people were living and that was their home. Um, they have seasonal work in that area and so they get uh, one of the challenges for the church is that people uh, come and leave that community so connecting long term relationally can be, be a bit of a challenge but they're there to meet that challenge and to meet the people that are coming in and out of that community um, they har harvest pineapple in that area so the next time you're having a nice pineapple think of them and pray for that uh, community Amen. so uh, some of the if you can take a moment as the leader and just kind of brag on your team <laughs> and what they and obviously you can't tell everything but just kind of yeah some about of the things did. that we accomplished accomplish well we had 11 of us going down um my we we had a great team okay so we had six guys and five women um my goal actually for 2021 is to have 15 of us go at least so if Think about now, and uh, maybe God is stirring in your heart right now for two years from now to, to head down with me again. But some of the things that we did, we did food distribution. Uh, this was just, if you read in the Bible, you know, Jesus did a lot of, quote, unquote, food distribution. He fed the people that he was ministering to. So we were able to do that. We fed about 26 families, and we brought food baskets to their homes, and we were walking in the community, so we were walking around the community and we were visible to people, and um, we were uh, dropping off food and, pr and we would pray for them and invite them uh, to our movie night that we did down there, which was kind of like our ATM here a little bit, um, and invited them to come and visit the church, and we invited the kids to come to the Awana program. Um, we also did construction work, Part of the built-in cost of the mission trip, it does sound like it is expensive, and it is. Our total cost was about $1,900, but as a team of 11 people, uh, that cost, we gave $4,000 for materials for construction. So, um, yeah, praise God. So we did a lot of electrical and hanging drywall and mudding. We put up a soccer net for the kids. Um, the amazing thing is, is their work didn't stop there. The materials that we were able to give to them, uh, they are continuing the work. And on their Facebook page, if you uh, are ever on Facebook, um, look them up. And they are, they've got photos of work that they are continuing. And it just blesses my heart uh, that they are able to continue the work that we, were, that we had started. So. Right. so God's moving on the trip. Share some about that. So the Holy Spirit has moved in so many ways on this trip. I just, it's hard to pinpoint, but I will just share a little bit about how God moved directly in me and through me. It actually started before I went on the mission trip. Um, if you remember in January, our church did a month of uh, praying and fasting. Well, we had that time of uh, that week of 24 hour prayer here at the church. And in my time in the prayer room, God put the scripture on my heart, and uh, I felt like God was telling me to share with the pastor down there. Well, even on the plane ride down, I just kept coming back to this verse, coming back to this verse. And I want to say ironically, but it's not ironic. It is the Holy Spirit. Right. Uh, it's Isaiah 65, which is actually the verse that, you know, arise, shine, and be radiant. Well, further on in that verse, it talks about how uh, people will come from other nations and bless you with their wealth. Well, I felt like that part of the verse, I was really particular, God really put that particular part of the verse for me to share with the pastor. The first day that we were there, he was sharing about his life story, about how he got into the ministry. And almost, I mean, word for word, he's saying, God told me that people from other nations will help to build his church. And my jaw is just like <laughs> dropping and I'm like, I have it marked in my Bible. I ran to my room where we were staying. I grabbed my Bible, I'm like, God told me to share this scripture with you. It just, um, just confirms the word that God put on his heart years ago. And then God put that in that scripture to confirm that. And that's just was 
one of many moments that the Holy Spirit was just moving. Right. So that's good. I love that. I love that. Amen. So to kind of summarize this, what was your biggest takeaway on this? Yeah. So I mean, other than how much you loved and missed me. Yeah. <laughs> he did that first service too, so I was waiting for that. <laughs> I'm still waiting for the a lot. A lot. <laughs> you never actually responded to a first service. So anything. I, just I think the scraps. people there. We have translators on our trip, which are our in-country uh, mission trip leaders, and I think they got pretty tired of me constantly bragging on my family. So yeah, yeah I did aw, miss it. <laughs> <laughs> Here, I was just like, oh, God, please let her come back. I can't do yeah, this. Yeah, one, one FaceTime call. I thought it was like. <laughs> I look dead. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah, pretty sad. Was, I was like, please come home. I don't care what you're doing there. Just come home. Leave. Yeah. Come home. <laughs> <laughs> it was the week where there were like a lot of snow days, and he's working and taking care of the kids. So. Yeah, I was, it's I was like, ready. yeah, I'm down here, you know, ministering. It's 85 yeah, degrees. Suffering for the Lord. <laughs> Feeling bad for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one of my biggest takeaway from this trip is I just feel like here at Radiant Church, there's just like a fire burning in a lot of a lot of people and like this. Almost, I just want to say it's almost like a revival happening here at Radiant Church. Yeah. And I just. The Holy Spirit is just moving so heavily among so many people here in this community, and it's just so awesome. So we took that, because of that fire that was burning on all of our hearts that went down there, um, we were just able to, God was just able to use us so heavily, and it was just, this was my fifth mission trip that I've been on, and I've never seen the passion for the Lord uh, just burning in people's hearts the way I did on this team. And the takeaway from that is, yeah, that, w that happened in Costa Rica, but their fire has not ended. And they've brought it back here, which is, which is so awesome because this community, is, this is a mission field. Wherever you're at, whatever God is calling you to do, like, your job is not just a job, that's your mission field, you know? So uh, the fire came back here and I'm just watching other people just get on fire for the Lord and that's my biggest yeah. takeaway, is not seeing that end. So right. that's awesome. Well, even, not only in this, but even the fact that uh, the amount of guys that went came back mm -hmm. and they're just like going crazy, which is great. Like a really good way, honestly. Yeah. Like we've been praying for the men of this church to, yeah. to, to really uh, grab a hold of things and to, to start leading yeah. well and uh, yeah. this is the first fruits of that yeah and i just really like one of the things god has really put on my heart is like different lands but same holy spirit right amen you amen know, same same calling to uh, uh serve your community and share the love of god right uh, this is not on here but I, I am curious to the person who was like listen i'm not a missions person that's not what i do uh, I can just do it here. I don't need to. What would you say as encouragement or, or something to consider even? Well, it, gosh, it's life changing. Yeah. It's just so life changing to go to a foreign land and see how God is working in a different culture because there's. We are God's people here, but they are God's people there, and God is moving different lands, but same Holy Spirit. Amen. It's just so powerful. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. Love you. <laughs> Thank you. So obviously, we need all types of missions. We need local missions. We need overseas missions. We need, we need short-term, long-term, and everything in between, all the gamut. This is, this is a lifelong call that all of us are a part of and all of us need to capture our hearts into, which is that we are not just living to try to figure out the Christian walk for ourselves, but we need to live outside of today, outside of the moments and the things that, are, that we're touching. We, we need to be those that are concerned about the things that God is concerned 
about Jesus himself when he looked out over the multitudes. He saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd and he was moved with compassion. If, if we don't feel that when we see other people, we see them as a nuisance or as the enemy or whatever it is, it's just in the way of my life. If we see it that way, then we don't have the heart of God. We've not spent enough time in his word, not spent enough time worshiping him or getting close to God in relationship to actually have the same heart that God had. So that when I see somebody either physically in need, spiritually in need, emotionally in need, to go, God is the only one that can completely answer all of your questions, and God has sent me to you. And so for the rest of this message, it's not even really a, a you know three-part message series per se, I asked the individuals that went on the mission trip to send me an email in some of their testimonies and I got a whole bunch of them and by no means am I able to read all of them today but I did want to read a few of them and then just share with you my takeaways from these seven different testimonies this will be real brief per each one but I feel that a- a- any one of these or possibly all of them um, will hopefully reach every one of your hearts for you to to grasp onto the call that God has placed over your life which is holy, it is ordained, and it is desperately needed for this day and age, this season that we're in. This first testimony comes from Judy. She said this, everyone had a servant's heart. Most of us were strangers as we had our first, second, and third mission trip meetings sitting across the table from each other in the conference room. One day into our mission trip, after praying shoulder to shoulder for the people's needs and serving together, I felt that in my heart so much, that everyone was a servant-hearted leader. And my takeaway from that short testimony, number one, is that we are all on the same team having the same goal. Are you engaged in the mission? That's the question. We're all on the same team with the same goal. Are you engaged in the mission or are you kind of letting it pass you by? See, all of us are trying to build our lives, our finances, our jobs, careers, things like that. We're all kind of building our own structures that we we lean into and find comfort in. And and some of that's good. Some of it may be unhealthy. But the one thing that we do all have in common is that we've all been called as sons and daughters of Christ. And we have also been called to go find those who they themselves are not connected with God and bring them into the same family that we're a part of. It's the same goal the same team, there's a mission field, and we need to be about the ministry of Jesus Christ. So the question is is not, is there a game to be played? Is there a mission field to be on? Is there something to be done or a team to be a part of? That's already answered. The question is, what are you doing with it? And, And not that we have to only ever always do mission trips, either across seas or local, but I just encourage you that that whether it be a small little moment where you're in a coffee house and you say, can I just pray with you? You're, you're just connecting with a family member or a friend or a coworker, or it'd be something bigger where you say, you know what, I'm going to lead a community group here that focuses on doing missional outreaches in this community. I'm not just going to sit back and go, man, why doesn't the church do more about missions? Why don't you do it? Why don't you? I'm asking you. I'm giving you permission. Please lead a community group. Do something about it. Go on a mission trip the next time that we have one. Be someone that serves in the homeless shelter or serves in the food pantry around here as part of Team Radiance. Guys, let's engage our hearts. None of us have a reason to be disengaged from the same goal that has been set before all of us. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 tells us, For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. We are co-laborers, co-workers together. And here's one of the problems with a church environment like this or you know, a lot of churches that you go to is when we don't work with each other, serve with each other, do ministry type things together, then what we experience is a Sunday morning where we just come together, there's an audience, a crowd, and we leave and we've not actually connected with anybody. Our hearts have not been tied. We don't have any victories together. We don't have any stories of God's goodness. We're just a bunch of people gathered, sitting in some pews in a larger room going, wow, look what we did on Sunday. Watch the person on stage. But when you get down into the trenches and serve and pray with and cry with and and do the things of ministry, some simple, some bigger, but when you do that, you're tied. Your heart is knit together with those people. And your, your life changes. That's how you experience more connectivity is when you actually choose to be engaged in the mission of God with other, with other fellow believers. 
This next story is from Ben. He wrote this, I believe that God's hand was most visible when we delivered food to a grandmother who was taking care of two boys. They were her grandsons whose parents were no longer in their lives. Their home was nothing more than a tin roof shed with dirt floors and some broken down furniture. She was more than happy to invite us in and pray for her and her family. She was crying when we finished and told us that she had been praying nonstop for God to bring her food and then he sent us. The amazing power of prayer, God kept his promise. Oh, I love that. And the takeaway, my takeaway from that is God hears his people's prayers. And often he sends us as the answer. Uh, sometimes theologically, we just struggle with the idea, does God even hear my prayers? Does he care? Is he out there? Where is he? What's going on? Like sometimes that's the biggest hurdle in our lives. But many times we'll cross that bridge and we'll get to the other side and go, yes, God's a good God. He loves me. He hears my prayers. But then to take it another step further and go, wow, the primary vehicle that God uses to bring his love and his provision about here on this earth is not angels, but it's us if we will partner with God. So it's not just that God hears the, our prayers. That's wonderful. That's an amen moment right there. God hears our prayers, but then often he sends us. We're the answer to someone's prayers. And obviously it's not for our glory. That story right there, beautiful story. This woman has been praying. She's raising her grandsons for just food. God, please send some food. Then here comes some individuals from Ludington, super tall, all super white, because we have no sun up here, like, hola, we got some food, and then God showed up, right? They didn't know it was going to happen. On their first, second, third meeting in the upper conference room, they didn't know that there was some grandmother crying out for God to bring help. You have no idea what kind of an answer to prayer you can be. It will never happen if you don't choose to partner with God. If you don't earnestly say, God, I actually want to be used this way. I think some of us, we wake up and we totally forget about that. What if one of the first things you prayed was, God, today, at my job, my friends, the coffee house, wherever I go, Lord, please open my eyes, Holy Spirit, let me see the need so that I can be the answer according to Jesus Christ and according to what he's done for me. That's what we all need. And here's the thing. When the Christians, the church, do that, it takes the wrong emphasis off of a church leadership team or staff or the guy on stage, and it puts it where it belongs, which is us loving each other, first loving God, and bringing the hope of God to those around us. Yeah. See, here's the thing about, here's the thing about church. Uh, I'll, I'll peel back the layer of something right now. The reason why people get frustrated about church, the church doesn't do enough, and why don't we see this? And not, not even just saying here, just church in general. Nine times out of ten, when you walk into an environment where the church, talking about a local church, is failing or not hitting the mark or not going where they need to do, it's actually not because of the leadership. It might be, there might be some issues there. May, may, maybe some issues with the vision or whatever. Most of the time, it's because as individuals of that church, they're not doing what they're called to do. And therefore, since they're not doing that, they transfer, they project their responsibility onto something that God never designed for this thing, this Sunday morning service, to be the primary vehicle of God's love to the community around us. This is a celebration. This is us coming together and letting God recharge our batteries, heal us, rejoice, so that when we go out, we can then do the work of the ministry. This isn't the work of the ministry. That's the work of the ministry. And when we do the work of the ministry, this celebration actually can become a celebration and it makes sense. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8 says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord. This is the prophet Isaiah. Whom shall I send who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. What if that was your prayer every morning? God, here I am. Send me. I'm not waiting for the next event. I'm not waiting for the next missionary outreach. Send me now right here. Here I am. Send me. 
Next story is from Ken. He wrote, during food distribution, we prayed for an older man that he had the most feeble living conditions. We talked with him, and he said his roommate was Jesus Christ. I just want to stop there. I love that. <laughs> Here's this old guy. He just living by himself, and his answer is not, I'm alone, and I'm just, I'm living down a broke down shack, and my dog's died, and my Ford pickup truck just died. Like, he didn't say any of that stuff. So, you know what his answer is to the loneliness and to all that kind of stuff? Jesus Christ is my roommate. It's not a, he's not coming from a position of lack. He's coming from a position of victory. Yeah. It's not, I'm just lost everything and I'm just alone in my shack. I have Jesus Christ as my roommate. How cool is that? All right? Notice, notice the gratefulness. Notice the heart condition he has. And now I continue reading on. As we prayed for him, he prayed for us. Extremely touching. I got on the bus and was convicted that I needed to share with the four guys that were doing construction at the church who did not have a chance to be present. I saw the conversation prior to it happening and knew that I would break down doing it. Back in the States, I would, nev I would not have been as bold and as transparent and as vulnerable, but I wanted to be obedient to God. I shared when we got back, and it was a big moment for all of us guys. <laughs> so here's my takeaway out of that longer story. Here's my takeaway. Time spent with God and pursuing his mission will produce supernatural boldness in your life. Now, to be clear, the boldness comes from the Holy Spirit. Remember Peter? He was very, Peter was all over the place. He was not, uh, he wasn't a consistent individual when it came to ministry. And then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 comes upon him and he has boldness and he proclaims and preaches and thousands of people get saved. So boldness comes from the Holy Spirit. But as spirit-empowered believers, those who have access to the Holy Spirit because he lives on the inside of us, we recognize that now the next step is time spent with God and pursuing his mission. See, when you do that, it will produce a supernatural boldness in your life. For, for Ken, it was to go back and tell these individuals, and it was an important, pivotal moment for that mission team. For us, when we are activated in the things of God, we spend time with him, we know him, he knows us and we know his voice when we know God and we spend time caring about the things that God cares about there is th this breaking off of all the things that would hold us back and boldness along with many other things but boldness begins to be stirred up in the inside of us passion excitement and then we come to a church or to a community group or another environment with people and we honestly at that point don't even care we just have this conviction on the inside of us. We know that we know that we know that we need to either speak about God or share a testimony or, or say, you know what, I'm struggling. Will you guys pray for me? There is this boldness that's about us as believers after, primarily after, we know God and we spend time doing his will. Or in other words, if I could flip it around this way, if you are waiting for there to be boldness on the inside of your life before you go and become a missionary to the world that you are living, you're going to be waiting probably a very long time. Can God just come and instantly give you boldness and all the things fall away? Of course, God can do that. He's done that. But the vast majority of the time, God meets you with boldness in every single thing that you have need of when you are in motion. God can work with you in your emotion. When you're standing still, you're the one saying, God, I'm not engaged. I don't want to be a part of this. But when you're in motion, God's going to come right on in and say, you know what? Everything that you need, boom. Today you need boldness? Fine, I'll give you boldness. You're going to have the perfect amount of boldness that you need for today. Acts chapter 28, verse 31 says, He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. The boldness came he was preaching about the kingdom and about the Lord Jesus Christ. They go hand in hand, but God is waiting for us to move. He will meet us exactly where we're at. Do not wait for all the stars to align and for everything to become wonderful and perfect, for you to speak to that coworker, for you to finally say, would you come to church with me or whatever it happens to be. Do it first. God will be right there with you. Trust me, he wants it more than you do. You're not trying to convince him of anything. Next thing I'd like to share with you, a story from Scott. If I had to give one word to describe the mission trip, it would be humbling. We have so much but still find ourselves wanting more. The only prayers the people of Costa Rica ever asked for was health for them and their families. 
The growth from this trip has just started, and I can't wait to see what God has planned for me next. The takeaway from this for me, number four, is I'm thankful. Thankful people can see the mission field all around them. Thankful people can see the mission field all around them. Consider our missionary team. They went down there, coming from a very rich land. They go down there, they see all the poverty, they see all the things that are lacking that are very different than the culture that we live in. And instantly their eyes are opened and they see clearly how much they are blessed. And out of that understanding, they minister the rest of that week with a God, thank you. Not only for what I have, but thank you for what I'm able to give right now. Thankful people. Those that are in the discipline of being thankful, because again, it's not an emotion, it's saying, I choose to be thankful. I choose to say, God, you are good, good all the time. I choose to say that. It is, it is what I am about. Thankful people, when they do that, they will be able to see more clearly the need, the hurt, and the brokenness that's around them. Also consider that old, older man. He's thankful. Jesus is his roommate. And here come these missionaries. They're praying for him. And he turns right around and prays for the missionaries. You know why? Because he's thankful. He's not looking at all the things that are messed up, waiting for God to finally fix them. He's saying, you know what? Jesus moved in. I'm thankful. Let me pray for you guys. So in other words, and hopefully this convicts us, not condemns us, but tugs our heart in other words, if, you're, if you go through your day-to-day life, day -to -day life and you can't see the need, it's probably because you're not a thankful Christian. I'll let that settle like a lead balloon. <laughs> Matthew chapter 23, verse 12. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. It's a humbling task set before us to wake up and to live our day and go, God, this is actually not about me. And everything that I have that's good is from you. And so, God, I just thank you. I'm not asking you that you just build only my life at the expense of everything else. God, I'm asking that whatever you have for me, that I would walk in it, and whatever you have for me to do, that I would do it. Thank you. That thankfulness will drive your willingness and your ability to touch those around you for the love of God. This next story is from Eric. Eric. And uh, there's more to this that I wasn't able to fit in here, but Eric was talking about how every time that he went to his devotional time that there were scriptures that would pop up and that, that he would read that were very important. And this is how Eric puts it. Those Bible verses were very encouraging to me as I never prayed out loud in front of other people and was a source of anxiety for me. Every Bible verse and passage I read that week was spot on with what I was about to to face like God was taking my hand and leading the way. I was mentally prepared for everything I would face. My takeaway, number five, is every believer can be led by the Holy Spirit. Every believer can be led. Notice I put the word can be. Again, the Holy Spirit, he's talking, he's moving, he's ministering. We have to choose to want to listen to it, and to be obedient to the still, small voice. Again, we're, all of us want this, the giant light in the sky moment where we're knocked off of whatever we're doing and God comes down, there's angels everywhere, and it's just, it's amazing. We all want that, but the reality is most of the time God speaks to us with the Bible says a still, small voice. It's that pull on our heart that we know we shouldn't do that or maybe we should talk to that person. Every believer can be led by the Holy Spirit. And what Eric is saying here is, here he is being obedient. I'm gonna read my Bible. I'm not just going to go on a mission trip and go, I'm being spiritual, so I don't need to read my Bible. No, I'm going to read my Bible. So he's being obedient. He's receiving the word of God. And at the same time, the Holy Spirit is grabbing those scriptures from the Bible, and he's popping them out of the Bible, illuminating those scriptures and going, you're going to need this today. You may have read this a hundred times, but today, you need this today. It was like God was guiding my hand. I was fully prepared for everything that would come my way. Every single believer can be led by the Holy Spirit in my my. The deep point on this is you don't have to go to Costa Rica for that to happen. That literally can happen every single day of your life. 
When you engage with God and you go, God, give me your word. I want to read it. Holy Spirit, speak to me. Literally every trial you face, every situation that needs wisdom or illumination, every single time, God will meet you there. It, trust me, it's not like we're trying to convince God to speak to us. We're trying to convince him to care about us and to know what's going on with the situation so that we can figure it out. No, God's going, hey, guys, I'm talking. I want to help you. I want to be your shelter. I want to be the one that you run to. I Listen, please. And we're going, well, I'm not sure if God really moves today or God still talks to us today or I'm kind of busy so I don't have time for that. And God's going, are you kidding me? You're my child. I'm not too busy for my child. I love you and I want to lead you and I want to guide you as the Spirit of God. John chapter 16, verse 13 says, when the Spirit of truth comes, speaking of the Holy Spirit, God himself, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. What if you walked into your day-to-day, -day, mundane, normal environments and you walked in and you had the full power and the presence, the strength, the perspective, and the truth of God on tap because the Holy Spirit's there with you. Every believer, everywhere you go, has the ability and can be led by the Holy Spirit if you choose to want it, to listen to the Holy Spirit, and then be obedient to the Holy Spirit. All those need to be in place. This next one is from Jessica. Before we left for Costa Rica, God gave Ken Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 as a verse to cover ourselves in prayer. The day before we left, my friend Jennifer called me and said, uh, that God had given her a vision of me in armor, and I said I needed to choose my weapons from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Imagine our delight when we arrived at the church we were serving and saw that that verse was all over their church, was Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. God drew us together before we knew it. He knew we would be family. The pastor and I had a conversation about why they used that verse, and he said that God gave him a vision about the spiritual battle we would face, and Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 was the verse given. The similarities between our two, church, two churches is something only God could bring together. I love that when the pastor said, we are from different lands, but we have the same spirit, as Rachel was mentioning. Different lands, but we have the same spirit. So the takeaway, number six, God is moving in ways and in dimensions that we are not able to even fathom. Trust him. Trust God. He is moving in, in, in ways and moments with people and circumstances that we literally cannot even wrap our minds around. You know, here, here we are, missionaries getting ready to go. Two people that aren't even going on the mission trip get a word, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, and then the moment that they land, they go to this church, they have banners all over the place and signs that say Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. And, and that's not a coincidence. It's not just because it happens to be a popular verse. That's because God already was knitting two church families together, their hearts together. So that when they went there, even though there was a language barrier, spiritually there was no barrier between us churches. That's what God does. We didn't know that. The pastor didn't know that. Years ago when he got that verse and put it up on the thing, he didn't know that we would be coming from Radiant or that there was such a thing as Radiant Church in Ludington. But God did. And that's how God works. Some of us were so concerned with the short game, but sometimes God ministers in the short game, but sometimes God has this long, long thing that only through time spent with God and faithfulness in God will that be revealed. And you go, oh my goodness, I had no idea that all the way back five years ago or whatever, that you were doing that. You were positioning that person here. You're changing my heart this way. You were bringing me to this ministry environment and God's moving all the pieces together. And then all of a sudden, Light shines into it and we go, oh my goodness, it's actually like you do care about me. That you do know what's going on and that you have been moving on my behalf. God is moving in ways and dimensions that we are not even able to fathom. Trust in God. If Ephesians, I want to read out of Ephesians. I may want to guess what, what it's going to be. That was terrible. 
Ephesians chapter, first service nailed it. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 through 21. Not Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Oh, we'll edit that out. Okay, um, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God is moving in immeasurable ways that we can't even wrap our minds around according to his power, not our ability, according to his power that is at work within who? Us. God is at work within us. And for us, he has not forgotten you. And the last story I want to share with you. It's from Ted. He wrote this. The pastor shared his vision. He said that the apartment that we were working on was for missionaries that will come and help in his church. He said that he started with nothing, no church, no bathrooms, no kitchen. He wanted to leave something for the next pastor so they will not have to start from nothing. He wanted a place for the children to come and play and learn about God in a safe place. Here's my final takeaway from these mission trip testimonies. Number seven. Build a legacy wherever you are at for the next generation. This pastor is building a legacy for the children. 60 kids in a service. On the Sunday morning service. That's the, that's the prime time service, so to speak. And they gave it to the kids. There's more in the kids' ministry than there is in the adult ministry. Sunday evening. Can you imagine if that was the legacy we had here at Radiant Church? We had to flip it around. We had to go to the gym. Children's ministry came in here. You know what that's called? That'd be revival right there. Yep. You know why? Because that would require children coming to this church long before their parents even come to this church. God's doing it there. Same spirit, different land. God can do it here. And my point on this, build a legacy wherever you are at for the next generation, is simply what you do matters Hopefully what you're doing is to bless and minister to those around you and the generation that's coming. <clears throat> Here's a pastor who has nothing, and yet he builds. We're going to make a bathroom, we're going to make a kitchen, we're going to do whatever we have to do so that missionaries can come in and we can bless and build and strengthen this thing together. And bear in mind... In this particular example, building a legacy was actually building a physical building. And sometimes, many times, it's that. I mean, right now, we're in a building. Somebody built this building. There's nothing wrong with buildings. They can be 100% spiritual, as long as they're dedicated to God and done the right way. But whether it be a building or just taking the time to hug somebody and pray with them and walk them through spiritually, whatever it is, look and find somebody and maybe it's not necessarily someone younger like the next generation, but look at the people around you and go, I want to build something for them so that they do not have to go through the things that I've gone through or they don't have to start at the beginning like I did. I want, my, I love one of my pastor friends when he was stepping out, and he, was, he was changing ministries and, and he was stepping out of youth ministry and, and he said to the next guy that was coming in, I want my lid, my ceiling to be your floor. In other words, I don't want this to be in competition. I want everything that I fought for, everything that I did, I want you to be able to come in and stand on top of that and build it even bigger and build it more for the kingdom of God. What if we lived from that perspective? In other words, we didn't, we didn't do things even here at the church just so that we could make sure we're happy with it. I like that. I feel comfortable with this. What if we actually built things in our lives and in the church that was for the next generation. That's for the people that are around us so that they can stand on your shoulders because God gave you the strength to do this. Stand on your shoulders so that they too can build a bigger and greater legacy for the generation after them. Psalm 145 verse 4 as we end says this, One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Let's stand up together. God, we love you. Well, my prayer is that this message, these stories, the videos, the pictures, Lord, that they would 
inspire us. God, to be thankful, to be eyes wide open, to, to desire to be led by your spirit, to be those, the God, that recognize that there is a generation that is lost and dying and that we have the ability to minister to them. We have the voice on the inside of us. God, help us to not be comfortable and satisfied with just this. Help us to want more, to do more, to live more of your love for those around us. God, I ask that what be known about us is not that we built great moments and spiritual cathedrals that felt great for us, but that we lived in such a way locally in our families, with our friends, and our businesses at church, abroad on mission trips, that we would live in such a way that it too is said about us that we have passed this on from one generation to the next, that your name is magnified on our lips. And we're not about ourselves, but we are about making your name be made great. God, we love you. As we sing this song, Lord, our desire is not that it's a song, but it truly is this point moving forward, maybe for the first time, maybe it's a reigniting in our hearts a passion, but either way, moving forward, God, that our anthem is you can have it all. It all belongs to you. Our time, talent, treasure, our dreams, ambitions, God, it all is for your glory so that those around us might fall in love with you, be saved by you, healed, set free, and set on purpose by and for you. God, we love you. We worship you now in Jesus' name. Amen.